I'm an Uber driver in the Atlanta area. Atlanta is a great place to be an Uber driver in a city of 400,000. There'll always be someone who needs a ride somewhere. I spent six hours a day in college courses, another eight sleeping, and most of the time in between shuttling people to and from around the Atlanta area. I've been doing this for about three years now, and in that time, I've seen it all. I've had drunken frat boys that threatened to kick my ass when I wouldn't give them a ride. I've had annoying, nagging passengers whose constant wants make you want to pull your hair out. The occasional cheating spouse who's hoping not to get caught. And local celebrities on their way to an event, to name a few. I've had my share of funny moments. A lady whose husband and her potential lover met her in the motel sidewalk and yelled at her and some, some scarier times too. The lady with the neck wound who tipped me even though I had to call her an ambulance. But this story... This story definitely falls under the weird category. I guess we could upgrade it to the scary category, all told. Uh, any night where I almost lose my life can definitely be called scary. My girlfriend and I live in a duplex near campus. I've lived there for the past four years, and she's lived with me for the past six months. And the area is a hotbed for Uber drivers. People always need a ride, people always coming back home, people needing to get to class. I'm not the only Uber driver in my area. Well, this happened in October, about a week before Halloween. And my girlfriend and I were taking a semester off since none of the classes we needed were available this fall. On the night in question, I was hurrying to get ready so I could drop my girlfriend off at the airport before I started work. She was going on a weekend trip to see her parents in Virginia, and I'd have the house to myself all weekend. I was a little skeptical about her destination, but I decided to let her dig her own grave if my suspicions were right. And maybe it was all the extra time I was spending at home, but I'd started to notice that something was a little off about her lately. She'd been fired from her job recently, and though she kept saying she was going to get another one, I didn't see her making any efforts to do so. All she seemed to do was talk about people on Discord. I didn't think much of it, and I wouldn't. Till later. We chatted on the way to the airport, talking about what she'd do when she got there and how much she'd miss me, and when we arrived, she kissed me goodbye, and off she went to the busy terminal. I pulled over into the temporary parking area and signed into my Uber app. The airport was usually a good place to find fares, and sure enough, there was someone trying to get a lift. He wanted to go to a hotel nearby, and after agreeing to the ride, I moved back into the concourse to pick him up. Now, he was a big dude, about six feet, and muscular through the chest. He had a bag, which he put in my trunk, and a smaller bag that he kept in his lap. I asked him where he was going, he verified the address, so he we went off. He was pretty quiet the whole way there, he looked cramped in the back seat like a sardine in a can, but he took it well. Mostly he just played on his phone, typing away to someone as we rode in silence. This wasn't uncommon, and honestly, I preferred clients who weren't chatterboxes. There's nothing worse than trying to hear your GPS over some drunk backseat DJ who wants the ox, or some tourist who wants a guided tour of the city as you dodge rush hourly traffic. We drove about 20 minutes before pulling up outside this motel in a seedier part of town. Told the guy we'd arrived, he quickly slipped the phone into his carry-on and offered to tip me for arriving so quickly. Now, I said it wasn't necessary, that sort of thing is usually handled through the app, but when he slipped me a 20 up next to my head, I, I took it with thanks. Rules or not, money is money. He asked if I'd pop the trunk when we had a suitcase, and he thanked me and walked through the front door. I was getting ready to check the app for fares in my area when I heard a noise from the back seat. It was this high-pitched ding noise that so many people use for their notifications. And when I looked at the back seat, I realized the guy had forgotten his carry-on. It had slipped into the floorboards and I could see the backlight of his cell phone shining through the mesh. I picked up the phone and I started to reach for the door when my eyes registered what the message on the lock screen had said. It was a picture of a pretty blonde girl. It was next to the message and it was asking if he'd gotten to the hotel yet. Another popped up to say that she was running a little late, but she'd be there in five. She couldn't wait to meet everyone, and she was so glad that she had finally done this. It's about time they all got together, and... And it was my girlfriend. I just stared at the phone for a few minutes before someone honked at me and I drove into the parking lot. The cab had just pulled up behind me, and as I parked, I couldn't, I couldn't help but notice who stepped out and walked towards the hotel. She still had her suitcase in hand, her, her furry boots, her parka, her leggings that she'd left the house in. She clearly hadn't seen me, and, and that was good, because at that point, I, was about to, I had about a thousand questions. See, she was supposed to be on a flight to Virginia, but instead, it looked like she was talking with some random guy on Discord. Was, was she cheating? 
Cheating seemed to be the most obvious answer, but... Why? We never had any problems. Our relationships had been smooth since the beginning, so why now was she cheating? Another message popped up, but this one was from a different guy. How many arrived? Yes. My girlfriend responded with five, Master. Damien seems to have lost his phone, but he's here too. I had meant to check for fares in the area, but instead I found myself moving even farther from the front of the hotel and watching the phone. I was in full information gathering mode, and now anything I could come back with would help me in the long run. It, if this was a misunderstanding or something, I, I wanted to know before I melt down on my girlfriend, but, but as it stood, it was beginning to look very sketchy. So I couldn't open the phone, of course. It was, it was one of those fingerprint locks that wouldn't open without a password or a fingerprint. Since I know neither, all I could do was watch the dialog boxes come up and gather the information that way. The boxes only stayed until another box came up, and often the messages were too long for the boxes to contain the whole message, so I was forced to read a little at a time. What I read made me think my initial ideas, well, they, they might have been a little bit off. At first, it looked like she was messaging with people at a hotel for an unspecified event. As I waited, I saw other people approach the office and move further into the hotel. I'm pretty sure that these people were the ones that she was talking with, because their arrival at the desk was followed a few minutes later by confirming that someone else had arrived. After eight or nine of them had arrived, they, they began talking to this mysterious master. The more they talked, the more I started to realize that this wasn't a, this wasn't a weird weird sex thing. When the group started asking him about the ascension, the altar site, to which he responded that they would learn more tonight. He asked my girlfriend if the sacrifice was ready, and she informed him that it would be when the time came. He went on to quote some verse to them, something that sounded pseudo-biblical, and referred to them as the coven several times. The more I read, the more I began to believe that she might be part of, like, might be part of a cult instead. It was getting dark when he told them that the preparations were taking longer than expected and that they should meet him at the altar site. He sent directions, which I got about a half of, and told them to be there before dark. Like a flock of birds, they all suddenly came from the hotel and moved towards cars parked in the lot. I ducked down, not wanting her to see me, and as I watched, she got into a late model black sedan and drove away in a convoy of other vehicles. Since I didn't have all the directions, I cranked my car and I followed them as they moved out of town and onto the highway. The sun was starting to sink and I didn't want to lose them, wherever they were going. It turned out where they were going was Polona State Park. The park was closed by the time we got there, but they all turned down a dirt side road and disappeared into the woods. The park is beautiful during the day, but in the late afternoon shadows, it had a spooky look to it that only a wooded area in fall can pull off. And I was suddenly having Blair Witch flashbacks as I parked beside the road. I let them get down the outlet road a pretty good stretch before I followed, not wanting to attract attention since I hadn't technically been invited. My girlfriend was definitely into some weird stuff here, I mean, weirder than even my imagination could have conjured up. And I knew that I needed to get her out of here before things got bad. As I drove down the bumpy outlet road, the sun started to set for real, and trees started leaning in on me like hands in a funhouse. The road was narrow, only a car at a time, and if someone decided to leave, I'd be in for some trouble. The darkness had swallowed my car before I reached the end and all at once my headlights created beacons of light in the encroaching darkness. When I reached the end of the outlet, we found a dark parking lot with several cars in it. it. must have been parking for a campground once upon a time. I could see a bathroom and a picnic area off of the parking lot, and the lot was flanked by lights that no longer worked. I turned off my lights and I got out of the car, but when no one immediately came out to get me, I figured they must have moved on. I stuck around the building, and sure enough, one was a woman's bathroom and a shower facility, and the other was the other was for men. Someone had set a couple of tents in the shadowy place between the buildings and the forest, but so far I had seen no one. As I took steps towards the tents, however, a bright light sprang up to my left, and I saw a large bonfire crackling in the woods. That's off to the side of the campground, and for a moment, the sudden flash leaves me glare-blind. 
when hands catch me under the arms and drag me forward, I'm momentarily unable to fight back. By the time my eyes adjusted to the sudden flare of light, I was already close enough to feel the heat of the bonfire and hear the chanting of those around it. It had been low at first, but now, now it had reached a fever pitch as they drew me closer to the fire. I struggled, but the two men, who were a lot bigger than I was, pretty sure that one of them was my fare from, from earlier, and... And as we came up short, inches before they would have simply walked me into the fire, a robed man in a lacquered mask stepped up and raised his hands for silence. The chanting tapered off immediately, and we stood in silence for a, a good thirty seconds before he spoke. Unlike the muscle-bound man before me, this guy was not on speaking terms with physical exercise. His robe bulged in the front. And had I not been suspended between the two men, he would have still been a head shorter than me. When he spoke, though, it was obvious who had the power here. This one, this one must have been master. As I told you, as Sister Serenity said, the sacrifice has arrived. Another robed figure moved away from the group and stood beside the fat robed man. She was about my height, had shoulder-length blonde hair, and when I met her gaze, I realized it was my girlfriend. I wondered why I didn't recognize her at first, but it became apparent almost immediately. In the firelight, her hair, a frizzy mess, as opposed to the straight and silky curtain that she almost always kept it in, and she looked almost feral as she stared at me. I didn't see any of her usual expression there, any of her love or happiness. She looked at me as though I was meat, like I was something that would bring her joy once it was cooked and black and offered on a plate. I was put on my knees before her, and the fat man handed her a silver knife that he drew out of a scabbard like a magic trick. She looked at the knife like she'd never seen one before, and as she came back to reality, she approached me with a blade, and I finally realized. I realized what I should have from the beginning. I was the sacrifice. He'd left the phone in my car on purpose, and even though there was no way she could have known, he'd get in my car. Somehow she had. She had meant for me to be there. She had meant for me to be her sacrifice. And as she raised the knife, as she raised the knife, I had to know why. Why did you do this? I thought you loved me. I said. Sounding pathetic, but still dying to know what this was all about. She looked at me, surprised, before saying, Because it's why I got with you in the first place. There's always a sacrifice before the coming of winter, before the coming of the green man. And this year it was my turn. I had to have someone to give to the fire. And you were there to fill the role. And with that, she raised the knife and I closed my eyes as I prepared for the strike. When the bullhorn sounded, it scared me just as much as it scared them. Drop the knife and put your hands in the air. You're all under arrest. But don't move or well. It was too late. The knife clattered to the ground next to my head and they all scattered like quail. I was dumped face first to the ground unceremoniously as my two captors beat feet for the woods. The sounds of shouts and boots and the occasional gunshots surrounded me as I lay still, hoping not to be shot out of hand. Eventually, a pair of boots come into my peripheral vision as my hands are jerked back as I'm flex-cuffed and lifted up so the officer can have a look at me. A half hour later, I'm in the detective's office, a warm cup of coffee and recently freed wrists. The detective's name is Reinhold, and he's very interested in the phone that I just put in his hand. We've been tracking these guys for years. They come to Atlanta the most often of any of their haunts. And it led me to believe that most of them are from around here. But once every three years, we find a body at the state park. All the internal organs missing. Fresh runes painted with blood. You're the first victim we managed to find alive. It's a wonder we found you in time. Now, he tells me a lot of things that evening. He tells me about the green man that they worship some Eastern European god or something, and how they believe if they don't make any sacrifices that they'll bring a terrible fury down upon men. They always make a sacrifice right before Halloween and some old rite they found somewhere and always some random person they've probably known for less than a year. I gave him my girlfriend's name as well as the guy from the airport who had used Uber, but 
but he told me that neither one checked out. Both were likely fake names, used to cover up their tracks, and despite messaging my girlfriend, all I received is a notice that the number had been cancelled. So that's where I stand now. I'm afraid to go home because, well, she has a house key. I'm afraid to go to my parents' house because she's met them as well. I don't know who to talk to, where to turn to. How many of our friends are involved in this little cult? The detective told me to be very careful, after all, because while they didn't catch my girlfriend, they did catch someone. He took me into a little room with a one-way mirror. I had me identify a pudgy man with a robe who was talking to another detective in a very animated way. He asked if this was the one my girlfriend had been talking to, her so-called master. And as I nodded, he suddenly leaned forward and yelled at the detective who sat back quickly despite the man's hands being chained to the table. Spit flew out of his mouth as he yelled, and even through the glass I could hear what he was screaming. You just don't get it! We aren't worshipping the green man! We're here to protect you all from him! If his fall sacrifice is not received, then he'll come, and he'll come, and he'll kill you! And you have to release me! The sacrifice has to be completed! That was about the time the two other officers ran in, and they restrained him, but... His message was clear enough. If anyone reading this has any information, I'd suggest you go to the police. The Green Man. The Green Men. They'll strike again. They'll strike again soon. If they believe that their actions keep us safe, if their delusion is something that must be accomplished, then any one of you may be in danger. I was groomed for six months. Kept safe like a pig for slaughter. But they don't have the time to be so choosy anymore. The green man has to be appeased and soon, lest we suffer his wrath. Who knows which of you might find yourself beside a fire this year. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are back after Halloween. So, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreons. Those uh, specifically are the ones that are in the description, and Joey Gilbert, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chumpinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van House, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Asia, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Kao, Caleb Dougal, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Alex, Steampunk Sinner, The Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. If you guys would like to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even helping with $1 actually helps keep me alive. So a big thank you to all of you who are there from $1 all the way up to however much that you guys give. Thank you. I appreciate you guys subscribing and checking back with the channel every single day because, dear lord help me, we are on daily uploads meaning new horror stories from me here at Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube or Mr. Creepypasta on Spotify. Sweet dreams, kids.